He reigns. Go with me in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 4. As you turn there, I read a story that was found in the little brown book of anecdotes about an author staying with his friend on a writing trip in Utah. And in between writing sessions, he would take breaks, he'd go out and go for a walk in the beautiful mountains, and he would hunt butterflies, which as far as things you got to hunt, pretty easy. And one evening, the author returned from one of his butterfly catching expeditions, and he mentioned at dinner to his friend that he had heard someone groaning most piteously down by the stream. Shocked, his friend said, well, what was going on? Did you, did you see? And the author said, no, I, I had to get the butterfly. The next day, it was discovered an old man had fallen into the gulch and died because no one came to help him. The Book of Anecdotes concluded this section by saying, while people around us are dying, how often we chase butterflies. If you've been with us in our study of Jonah, you probably know why I mentioned this story. Jonah, it wasn't butterflies for him, it was his plant. He loved this plant we're going to read about so much, even though the people of Nineveh were in desperate need. In Jonah chapter 4 today, we'll see that if we are to become faithful evangelists, we must remain focused on having the right person in the center of our lives. As a spoiler, it's not us. Let's pray and ask God to help us understand His Word. Father, we are thankful for Your Word. We are thankful that You have brought us here today. Some of us myself included, are tempted to chase the butterflies of this life rather than be concerned about those who are um, piteously groaning around us in need. God, I pray, break our hearts, fill us with pity. You are a God full of pity, and we say we want to be like you, so make it true. Break our hearts for the lost. Break our hearts to care more about your glory than our pleasure in earthly things. God, we thank you, we praise you, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We see first in our text that uh, Jonah had a self-centered view of life. We can see this as we quickly examine his prayer in verses 1 and 2. Let's count how many times he talks about himself. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. In three sentences, Jonah talks about himself eight times. And especially when we look at the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, you don't have to put the pronoun. He just keeps mentioning himself over and abundantly more than he needs to. Why is this so upsetting? Well, it shows us that in his self-focus, he has rejected God's person, and we do the same. Let's review our story. Jonah has finally gone to Nineveh, should have gone the first time, didn't, got in a boat, got in a shipwreck, was in a fish. He finally went to Nineveh, preached a terrible five-word sermon, and even though it was terrible, the whole city, from the greatest to the least, believed God and was converted. And all of this occurred in Nineveh on a single day. At the end of that day, we get to chapter 4, and we see that Jonah is exceedingly displeased and angry. To be clear, it's not just that Jonah didn't like it. This word displeased is often in the book translated evil. We could say to Jonah, it was evil in his sight with great evil. Jonah truly believed that God's pity on Nineveh was an evil act because he was interpreting God through his own personal experience. And it is because of Jonah's self-focus that we see he has rejected God's person. Flip back to chapter 2, verse 1. Notice how Jonah as the narrator talks about his prayer. 2.1 says, as Jonah drowns, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. Now look back at 4. 
Who does Jonah pray to? He prays to the Lord, period. Full stop. As far as Jonah is concerned, Yahweh is no longer his God. <clears throat> but why? Why is Jonah so angry? Well, it's because he knows the character of Yahweh. In fact, he says in verse 2, that's why he fled to Tarshish in the first place. He says, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Jo Jonah didn't flee because he was afraid of Nineveh or because he was afraid of God. He fled because he knew God was gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah knew who God was and he saw who God was towards Nineveh as evil. And so he flees trying to prevent God, in a sense, from being God. We know this kind of thought process in, in different contexts, right? So we know our kids, if they don't get their nap, they're really going to struggle to obey. So what do we do? We make sure the kid takes a nap. We know the kid's sinful little nature, so we're going to give him a nap so he's not extra tempted. We know what will happen if he doesn't nap. Or for us as adults, we know if we go into the bakery section of Walmart, something's going in the cart that shouldn't be there. So we don't go in that section because we know ourselves. We know what we will do. And you say, well, those are bad examples. They're negative examples. And you're right. But in this moment, Jonah viewed God and his character as negative. He viewed God as evil for being gracious to Nineveh. He is trying to prevent God from being God. Specifically, he's trying to prevent God from being gracious. Jonah could not allow Nineveh to experience God's grace. He didn't want them blessed with rewards they didn't deserve. And Jonah was trying to prevent God from being merciful. He could not allow God to be merciful to Nineveh and withhold judgment and destruction. Jonah certainly couldn't risk God being slow to anger. From Jonah's point of view, God had already been too slow to anger. He had been indulging Nineveh in their sin. How could God continue to put off wrath? And don't even get me started on how Jonah felt about God being abounding in steadfast love. Because again, we talked about this last week. That's the word chesed. It's the Hebrew word for covenant, steadfast, faithful love. And Jonah has no willingness. From his point of view, the, the covenant, steadfast, faithful love of God, that is for Israel and Israel alone. He will not share that with Nineveh. He won't share the love of God. I remind you of the, the other brother and the prodigal son story. And of course, his greatest fear is that God would relent from disaster. In this verse, Jonah is quoting from God's revelation of his deepest character from Exodus 34. Moses says, show me your glory. God says, I'll proclaim my name. And he says, behold, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah quotes God himself. He quotes God's words back to God. It's not that his theology is wrong. His theology is spot on and he hates God for it. He thinks God is evil for it. It's not that God, Jonah doesn't know who God is. It's that Jonah rejects who God is. And friends, we must be clear. We cannot reject the works of God without also rejecting the person of God. There is no separating God from his work because God doesn't just do things. He is things. It's not that God gives grace and is merciful. It's that God is grace and mercy. It's not that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love because he likes to do those things. He is those things. God relents from disaster because that is who he is. We cannot reject the works of God without rejecting the person of God. And we all say, yes, amen, Jonah definitely was wrong. But let's think about ourselves. For example, God, in his sovereign work, created us the gender we are and he designed the gender roles we are to live by. To reject God's work and his good design for our gender is to reject God himself. And I'm not just talking about those who struggle with what used to be called gender dysphoria. We all struggle with our genders, whether we would say it or not, because men struggle to lead, husbands struggle to lead, wives struggle to submit, single people struggle to serve the church. Whatever God has designed our role to be, we rebel against it and we buck against it. And all of us fail to perfectly put off lust and use our sexuality to please God. We all struggle. Regardless of what aspect we, we may not like, we must remember God has made us this way. He's the creator God. To reject how he has made us is to reject him. Or we may be okay with our gender, but we, just, we can't stand the idea that God would judge people and send them to hell. <clears throat> but friends, he's a holy God. To reject his holy judgment is to reject him. Or we may not like 
uh, we may like the work of God in saving us, but we don't like his work in sanctifying us. We don't want to be disciplined. But friends, God is our loving father. To reject his discipline is to reject him. We cannot reject the works of God without rejecting the person of God. <clears throat> we must tune our hearts to the words of the psalmist. Psalm 111, 2, he says, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. If we are to love God, we must love what he has done, because what he does is who he is. We must humble ourselves and accept not only who the Bible says God is, but also what the Bible says God does. He's our wise creator, our holy judge, and our loving father. He will act according to his character. We must rejoice in him and his works, or we will reject not just his works, but also his character. Jonah rejected God's person, so it's no surprise we see in verses 3 and 4 that he also rejected God's purpose. Although two chapters ago, Jonah was desperately begging for his life to be preserved, now he honestly believes that it would be better for him to die than to live. What has caused such a great change in Jonah's heart? I, I think that the best way to understand this is Jonah felt like the biggest traitor in the history of Israel. Because from his point of view, he had heard the prophecies of Hosea, who lived at the same time. And Hosea had said, at some point, Assyria will come and destroy Israel. And then Jonah goes to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And he preaches as poorly as he possibly can, but he still preaches. And they all get saved. And because they're saved, that means God's not going to relent. or God's not going to punish them. And because God won't punish them, that means they'll continue to survive. And that means Hosea's prophecy will be fulfilled. From Jonah's point of view, the destruction of Israel is now his fault. It's all pinned on him. If he hadn't done what he did, Israel would have been saved. His homeland, his family, his people, all he holds dear is now doomed. And rather than submit to God's purpose, Jonah pleads with God to just kill him and take his life. He would rather have his life taken from him now than continue living in a world where he was the one who destroyed Israel. And how does the Lord respond to this selfish, proud, sulking prophet? God asks him a question. He says, do you do well to be angry? In something I can't even, honestly, I struggle with this. It, he calmly, graciously, kindly asked Jonah a question despite Jonah's sinful anger. The, the grace of our God and that he doesn't just strike Jonah dead immediately, especially because Jonah's asking for it, is immense. He asks him, do you do well to be angry? And then rather than respond to great God's gracious question, doesn't it bother you when people don't answer your questions? And God just lets it go. Jonah gets up and he walks out of the city. Though there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who are desperate to learn anything about Jonah's God, he chooses to walk out of the city and sit on a hill and have one of the most determined pity parties in history. Jonah is tired of doing things God's way. He's sick of having to obey. He will not listen to the loving question of God. He's doubled down. He's rejecting God's purpose, and he leaves the city to do his own thing. And you'll notice the text says he went east. And throughout Genesis and the Old Testament, whenever anyone goes east, it's in rebellion, at least almost always. Adam and Eve, when they left the garden, they went east out of the garden to find more sin. When the people left where the boat landed to build Babylon, they went east. Always they go east, away from God. Jonah is walking away from God. And I think we, we all at times have responded like Jonah. We are totally uninterested in God's purpose for us. We just want to live our own lives and do our own thing. We don't want him using us. So at times we're angry and then, and then maybe our spouse lovingly confronts us. Or maybe even just says something gracious and kind. And isn't that just the worst? When you're all angry and then they're nice to you? Oh, heaps coals on our heads, I think Proverbs talks about. And so we double down and we get more angry. Or we're depressed and our friends try and encourage us. And then we like feel convicted about it. So then we're just more depressed. Or maybe there's been times where we're convicted of our sin, but then we hear the preacher or our brother or sister share the word with us and we just double down on our stubbornness. We're not going to repent. I don't care what God tries to say to me. We get all wrapped up in our emotions and we, we give in and we give up control to our emotions. We just do whatever we want. And friends... I pray, let us hear the question of God as though he spoke it directly to us. Do we do well to be angry or depressed or stubborn? Do we do well? 
Friends, our emotions are never out of control. They are fully and completely within our control. The question is the same question to Jonah. Will we choose to do well in our emotions? Or will we choose to allow them to control us and sin in them? What will we choose? If you're struggling to do well in your emotional life, there is hope in the Word of God. Two resources I would point you to. First of all, the Psalms. There are whole Psalms that are written when the writer is angry, when he's anxious, when he's fearful, when he's depressed, when he's guilty, when he's joyful. And I mean, there's good ones too, but there's a lot of really tough ones. So if you are struggling to process or deal with certain emotions, I I pray go to the Psalms and see that God has given us a whole book that teaches us how to deal with our emotions. But another book I would point you to is uh, Feelings and Faith by Brian Borgman. It just gives a whole good, brief, understandable theology of emotions. It's a good book if this is an area you struggle with. If you struggle in any of these areas, talk with someone here. We would love to help you work through these and have Christ-like control over our emotions. Jonah has rejected God's person as evil. He's rejected his purpose as evil. But Jonah's prayer and anger was not only directed against God, it was also directed against Nineveh and their repentance. We see in verse 5 that when we have a self-focused view of life and of evangelism, we reject God's pardon of others. Look at verse 5. Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. After preaching his terrible five-word sermon and seeing God's incredible miraculous work among the Ninevites, Jonah prays his angry and selfish prayer and books it out of the city. And does he go home? I would expect him to just go home. But he doesn't go home. He heads east, maybe because there were hills overlooking the city there. And he doesn't plan on leaving anytime soon. He builds a booth for himself, like a temporary lean-to shelter. How long was he planning to stay there? I would bet about 38 days until the deadline came. Because he wanted to see what would become of the city. And we have to think about this, because at first we may read this and think, oh, Jonah's hoping God will change his mind and blow up the city anyway. But I think if we think about it a little bit deeper, it can't be that, because his whole problem is that God is consistent with his character. So what is Jonah's hope founded on? Jonah's hope is desperately attached to the possibility that Nineveh's repentance is fake. His only hope is that Nineveh's repentance is fake. And if it's fake, then God will punish them. Jonah is sitting there desperate that someone's salvation is false. Not just someone, like 120,000 someones. He is waiting to see what will become of the city. He is waiting to see their repentance fail. And I think this is made so much worse by the fact that he's sitting in a booth. This booth has some important context to us if we're students of the Old Testament. Because one of the yearly feasts the Jews were commanded to follow was the Feast of Booths. It was a feast established by God where they were commanded to move out of their homes for a week and live outside in a temporary booth. And God had a purpose for this. He tells us in Leviticus 23, what was the purpose? You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. Here's why. So that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The purpose of the feast was to remind Israel every year that God's provided for them while they were in the desert. And why were they in the desert so long? Because they couldn't save themselves from Egypt And then even once they got out of Egypt, they couldn't go into the promised land by themselves. And then they tried to, and then they just sinned and sinned and sinned. And their repentance was shown false and false and false. And they lived in booze for 40 years. And Jonah is sitting in one of those booze, looking at Nineveh, praying that their repentance would be false and God's wrath would fall on them. Jonah uh, Jonah in 4 or 5 pictures himself in a booth designed to remind him of his dependence on God, praying for false repentance in others. He will not accept the fact that God has pardoned them. He would not be satisfied until he got to watch them suffer. Now, as good Christians, we would never say something like that out loud. But I think if we're really honest, we struggle with this also. When our spouse sins against us and we are deeply hurt, When our friend betrays our trust, causes us great shame by sharing our secrets. 
or our little brother or sister hits us and takes our toy. But then they confess and they repent and they're forgiven by God. And then we just have to forgive them? We don't get to make them cry like they made us cry? We don't get to watch them feel bad like we feel bad? We don't get to watch them suffer for their sin? Friends, this desire for revenge is contrary to the gospel. Because Jonah was too angry to see it, but Nineveh's sin did not go unpunished. God did not forgive Nineveh because he just decided to let it go. This is what Paul tells us in Romans 3. He says this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. His forbearance, his patience in passing over sins, it doesn't mean sins go unpunished. That would be wicked and evil. God is just and he is a holy judge and he will punish all sin. The joy is that we can be forgiven. God can be forbearing. Our souls can be passed over for punishment. Not because God decides not to punish our sin, but because he decided to punish someone else. This is what Paul says. God put forward as a propitiation by his Christ's blood. Nineveh found forgiveness not because God decided not to punish their sin, but because in divine forbearance he knew he would put forward his son about 800 years later to die in their place, to take the full wrath of God in their place. And the same thing has been done for those who are in Christ and sin against us. We cannot hold on to our anger. We cannot be like Jonah. We cannot reject their pardon because to reject the pardon of those who sin against us who are in Christ and try to punish them is to say that Christ's sacrifice is not sufficient. When we try to hurt someone who hurt us, we're saying Jesus didn't, he wasn't hurt enough. When we we try to make someone cry because they made us cry, we're saying Jesus didn't weep enough. We're saying he didn't suffer enough. We're denying the work of Christ on the cross. To refuse the pardon of God for others is to refuse the power of the gospel in our own lives. So friends, let us rejoice that God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love towards us, but also towards others. Let us strive to be like him in that. Not to let things go unpunished, but to trust that Christ's blood is punishment enough. We must submit to God's pardon of others. Jonah had rejected it, but the root issue here under all these things is that Jonah rejected God's right to do what God wants to do. He rejected God's sovereign providence. Let's read verses 6 through 9 where we see just God working miracle after miracle to help Jonah understand this. Starting in verse 6, Now the Lord God appointed a plant, made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plants that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die, and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Clearly, Jonah was not in the mood for a conversation about Nineveh. So God decides to be creative and works a number of miracles to try and draw Jonah out. He appoints a plant to come up and provide shade for Jonah's head. Jonah built a booth for this purpose, but apparently wasn't very good at it because the the plant provided better shade. And you notice, Jonah responds with exceeding gladness. This is the only time in the book he is recorded as being happy. Not when God speaks to him in chapter 1. He should have been super happy that God would speak to him. He wasn't. Wasn't happy when he found the boat. Wasn't happy when the fish saved his life. Wasn't happy when he got spit up on dry land. Wasn't happy when he was safe in Nineveh. None of that made him happy. But this plant gives him shade as he sits there in his pity party. Oh, man, he loves that plant exceedingly. But the second miracle... The following day at dawn, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and caused it to wither. This plant he loved so much, now it's dead. And the third miracle is that God appointed a scorching east wind to come and blast Jonah on that hill. One commentator describes a wind that happens in that area of the world like this. When the wind is experienced in the Near East, the temperature rises dramatically, 
The humidity drops quickly. It is a constant and extremely hot wind that contains fine particles of dust. Like standing in a, a sand blower in an oven. It's not great. And how does Jonah respond? Well, he begins to faint. And this isn't like, oh, he's just kind of hot and he's fainting himself. This is the same word he uses in 2.7 to talk about how he was drowning and his life was fainting away. Jonah is dying of dehydration and exposure on that hill. <coughs> and how does he respond? Does he respond like he has in the past? Does he, like in chapter 1, get up and flee? Or in chapter 2, does he cry out for salvation? Or in chapter 3, does he attempt to just obey? He's like, fine, I'll go back in the city. He doesn't do any of that. Instead, Jonah once again prays and asks God that he might die, saying it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah is so unhappy about his life, he decides it would be better for him to be dead than alive. And he not just decides, he declares it. He speaks to the God of life who kills and makes alive. He says, you are wrong. I should be dead. You are wrong for me to be alive. It is better. My plan is better than yours. Take my life from me. And God strikes him dead, right? That's what I would do. We're all happy I'm not God. I cannot fathom the grace of God in this moment. He says, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Jonah won't talk about Nineveh, so maybe he'll talk about the plant. And man, he is ready to talk about the plant. Jonah says, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Confronted over and over again, Jonah responds with anger. He spits in God's face. He declares he alone is just. He says, yes, I am right to be angry. I have the right to decide who lives and who dies, whether it's me or Nineveh or this plant. I am the sovereign one. I am the just one. I am right, which means God is wrong. And not just that, when he says angry enough to die, the way this is written, it has the force of like an expletive. He's cussing God out to his face. Jonah has rejected God's providence. He will not live in a world where God not only gives, but also takes away. He will not live in a world where his beloved plant dies while Nineveh lives. He will not live in a world while Nineveh pros prospers and his prophet suffers. But Jonah's rejection of God has not changed God at all. Praise the Lord. Look back at verse 6. Why has God done all this? The ESV says to save him from his discomfort. But there should be a little footnote in your Bible. That word discomfort is the word we've seen throughout the book translated evil. Same word in verse 1, same word in chapter 1, verse 2, where God said that Nineveh's evil had come up before him. God had saved Nineveh from their evil, and now God is going to save his prophet from his evil. We see from the first moment God has been working to save Jonah. He declared and relented disaster on Nineveh to save him from his evil. He sent the storm and the fish to save Jonah from his evil. He sent the plant and the worm and the wind to save Jonah from his evil. All that God does in this entire book is to save Jonah from his own evil. And friends, the same is true for God's people today. So let's think. Let's try and think biblically like Jonah was not thinking. Has God blessed you with a promotion that has given you more responsibility? Maybe that God is trying to save you from the evil of laziness. Or maybe God took away a promotion that you were expecting. Could it be that God is trying to save you from the evil pride in your career and love of money? Has God blessed you with a loving and caring and gracious family? Could it be that he's trying to save you from your pride and self-isolation? Has God taken away close relationships and left you feeling lonely? Could it be that God is trying to do this to save you from evil dependence on others rather than on him? Has God blessed you with health, ability, time, and money? Maybe he's trying to save you from the evil of hopelessness. Has God taken away your health, ability, time, and money? Could it be that God has done this to save you from the evil of self-reliance? Friends, we must put off this false faith that Jonah had and strive for the faith that Job expressed early on in his trial. The Lord gave, the Lord take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> God gave the plant and he took it away, but Jonah cursed the name of God. Job didn't know what God was doing, neither did Jonah. We, we never know. I'm just guessing, right? God doesn't tell us why he does the things that he does. But if we desire to fulfill the purpose 
that God has for us to grow and become more like him, if we trust in the person and character that we read about in scripture, if we are dependent on the pardon he has offered us, then we will trust his providence even when it means great loss to us. Because more than anything else in this world, we desire to bless the name of God. If that is our goal in life, if we have a God-centered view of life, then our purpose will be to bless him. Whether God is giving or taking away, it won't matter. But if we have a self-centered view, everything is filtered through that goal of what benefits me, what helps me, what most makes me happy. Friends, that's a horrible way to live. You'll end up pouting on a hill in the, in the sun, dying. But there is a better way, and God calls Jonah to this better way. He calls him to a Savior-centered view. Look at verses 10 and 11. There God, in incredible grace, says, we read, And the Lord said, <clears throat> You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into a being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. God in grace explains to Jonah why he should pity Nineveh. And he uses Jonah's pity of the plant as an example. Three reasons he gives us why we should be filled with pity for unbelievers around us when we have a Savior-centered view. Number one, they are made in the image of God. They are image bearers. God confronts Jonah by pointing out he pities the plant for which he did not labor, nor did he make it grow. Jonah didn't find some seed. He didn't plant it. He didn't fertilize or care for it. It grew while he was asleep. Yet when the plant died, Jonah pitied it and became exceedingly angry. But this is not God's relationship to Nineveh. Each person in that city and every person here today, every person we meet has been labored over by God. The psalmist says that he formed our inward parts, that he knitted us together in our mother's room before we were even born. He had written the days of our lives in his book. God has labored over us. And we know that feeling of pride and passion and protection we have over things we labor over. If we pick up dinner for our spouse on the way home and they don't like it, eh, not a big deal. We're probably more upset about the money we spent on it than the fact that he doesn't like it. But if we tell our spouse we're going to make their favorite dish, for like our anniversary, and we go to the store, we, we find the great best recipe. Spend like three, it takes forever to find a recipe online because everyone wants to tell you their life story. Right, so you go through all that, you get the recipe, you go to the store, you get the best ingredients, you spend like six hours cooking it, and then your spouse walks in the door with a half-eaten McDouble goes, now nah, I'm full, thanks. We care a lot about that meal. We don't really care about what we picked up at the store, but man, we care about, the, why? Because we labored over it. Jonah hadn't labored about this plant, but God had labored for Nineveh. God has labored over every person we meet. Shouldn't we pity them? Shouldn't we care about them? Shouldn't we love them? Friends, the same is true about God. He cares about each person because each person is lovingly made in his image, crafted perfectly. <clears throat> we get a hit of that. Look at verse 11. God says, Nineveh is a great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons. He calls it great, which I take as God being proud of his image bearers. Now, don't get me wrong. Nineveh was full of sinners. They did a lot of evil. But they've done a lot of good things too, especially as we consider the creation mandate. And from Genesis 1, let's think about it. Nineveh had done a good job multiplying and filling the earth. There's at least 120,000 people in that city. That's a lot of multiplying. They've done well. And they've also done good work to subdue the earth. I'm not talking about the violent conquest. I'm talking about the fact that they built a wall that was 55 miles long and had room for 120,000 people. That takes a lot of subduing. And they also had dominion over the animals. Just, Jonah keeps writing about these cattle that filled the city. Clearly, they had done a good job living out God's creation mandate to mankind to be fruitful and multiply, to subdue and have dominion. They had done that. God was saying, these people are made in my image. He's reminding Jonah of Genesis. And there's one more clue. God doesn't say there's 120,000 people, which is, would be the normal Hebrew word. He says 120,000 persons, and the Hebrew word is Adam. We get Adam. He says, 
look, I named my first human Adam. All these people are descendants of Adam. And, and who was Adam made in the image of? In the image of God. This word Adam, when it's used in the Old Testament, it's, it's most often used to compare humans to other created beings, to animals. God cares about animals, right? He mentions the cattle over and over again, but God cares more about humans because we're made in the image of God. We're Adam. I think this is why God ends his question in such a weird way. I mean, weird to me. To him, it's perfect, right? So, but to me, I don't understand. Why is he mentioned cattle? I think this is why. He says, look, Jonah, you care about this plant. But there's a bunch of plants in Nineveh, and more than plants, there's a bunch of cattle. And cattle are worth more than plants. And if you care about the cattle, shouldn't you also care about the people made in my image who are worth more than the cattle? We learn from Jonah that true faith in God is completely incompatible incompatible with prejudice against any other human of any kind. But Leslie Allen wrote, A Jonah lurks in every Christian's heart, whimpering his insidious message of smug prejudice, empty traditionalism, and exclusive solidarity. Friends, we need to ask ourselves, we may say, well, I'm not racist. I'm glad. But who are we tempted to see as unworthy? Do we not see the value in ministering to the very young or the very old? Do we think those in poverty or those in great wealth are unworthy of our attention and love? We see this in our culture, right? People walk around with shirts saying, eat the rich. Do we think that people of different races or from different countries are less valuable to God than we are? What about those who've rejected Christ and are spreading false religions? Are they less in the image of God than we are? What about those who struggle with different sins than us, like addicts, or those who struggle with their sexual identity or their gender? Here's a good test we can gain from Jonah. If you see a person, they're made in the image of God. There's no other dividing line. If you look at Genesis 1, every creature is made according to its kind. Humans, it's not said that about because we don't have multiple kinds. We, we just have the one. We're humans. We're made in the image of God. And every person we see is worthy of our love and worthy of the gospel. Whether it's an unborn baby or an immigrant who crossed the border illegally, they are equally made in the image of God and they are worthy of love and value. They are more valuable than much cattle. They are more valuable than plants. They are more valuable than anything else than creation because they're made in the image of God. And they are worthy of us pouring out our lives to share the gospel message with them. This is the first reason a Savior-centered life will drive us to evangelism, because we will see people as image bearers of God. But God gives us a second reason. When we have a Savior-centered view, we'll be moved by pity to evangelize the lost because they are immortal. Look at what God says about the plant. He says, look, that plant came into being in a night and perished in a night. He appointed it while Jonah slept. It grew, and then it died the next day. But Nineveh was not like that. Nineveh was founded during the days of Noah, which is a long time ago, even for Jonah. And it was, more importantly, it was full of souls that will exist for the rest of eternity. And we may say, well, yes, of course, obviously. Jo Jonah's unhappiness over the plant was silly. He should have known it was a temporary thing. But friends, we are continually obsessed with temporary things. We think they will never fade. Over and over again, we're tricked. A few examples I thought about. The Roman emperors thought no one would ever tear down their empire. Didn't work out well when the barbarians came. The CEO of Blockbuster never thought their company would fall until Netflix came around. No one thought it was humanly possible to run a, a mile in less than four minutes. That was just accepted scientific fact until Roger Bannister did it in 1954. And everyone said, well, no one will ever beat his record. It's been beaten 18 times since then. Jonah's exceedingly glad response to the plant sounds silly until we consider how quickly and powerfully we become attached to the things that turn out to be so very temporary in this life. That is why God's calling us to a higher focus, an eternal focus with him as Savior in the center, to focus on evangelizing lost souls because they will spend forever either in hell or with Christ. That should be more important than anything we do in this life because that has everlasting consequence. We have to focus on encouraging our brothers and sisters in the church because we'll dwell with them forever. Yeah, we, we, we should fix up our houses. That's fine. But you're not going to have that house in the new earth 
but you'll have one another in the new earth. Focus on what's immortal. And most importantly, we need to focus on our relationship with the eternal one rather than on his temporary creation. So friends, let's examine our lives. What are we exceedingly glad about that will, in a very short time, prove to be temporary? Are we devoting ourselves to our passions and our hobbies and entertainment? We know people who pour their lives into cars and sports, exercise, crafting. They make us glad, but that gladness is temporary because it's based in temporary. Or are we devoting ourselves to our careers? Again, it seems wise in the moment. After all, we need money to live, but we must never devote ourselves fully to building up temporary wealth rather than storing up treasure in heaven where rust doesn't destroy. And briefly, let me speak to the parents here. I know that we love to put our kids into programs and classes and activities, and so much good can come for those things. I know that. But if we choose to take our kids out of church and put them in activities rather than, than gathering with the church, we are living for the temporary rather than the immortal. We're living like Jonah, and we will face the consequences of our foolish choices. Just some history. All of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And within two generations, Nineveh's armies were at the gates of Jerusalem mocking God and destroying Israel. Unless we want that same generational rejection to happen to our children and our grandchildren, we must devote ourselves to immortal things above the things of this life. We must teach our children by example to put the Lord and his church and his worship above all other activities and desires. We must teach them that God comes first because if we don't, Then a generation or two, they will be mocking God. We will only have our memories of temporary gladness rather than immortal joy with them forever. We must work for things that are immortal. We must be moved by pity to evangelize the lost, especially our children, because they are immortal souls who will exist forever with Christ or in hell. And number three, God tells us that a Savior-centered view will lead us to pity the lost because they, are, um, because they are ignorant. And when I say that, I don't mean the rude way that it's used now. I mean the original meaning that just means they don't know things. It's not a statement on their character. It's just true. <clears throat> I think this is what God means when he says that those 120,000 persons do not know their right hand from their left. They don't know spiritual truth. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 4. Unbelievers are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Why was Nineveh greedy to practice all this impurity? It's because they were ignorant of the truth of God. In their ignorance, they did not know they must change from their sinful ways, nor did they know how, nor did they care. They were ignorant of the truth of God. John Owen, in his book, Overcoming Sin and Temptation, wrote the following, Unless a man is a believer, he can never kill any one sin. There is no death of sin without the death of Christ. A man may easier see without eyes or speak without a tongue than truly kill one sin without the Spirit. Therefore, killing sin is not the business of unbelievers. God has not called them to it yet. They must focus on conversion as their work. The conversion of their whole soul, not the killing of this or that particular lust. Let the soul be first thoroughly converted, and then, looking on him who they have pierced, humiliation and sanctification will ensue. So friends, if you're here today and the idea of killing sin and loving others and pitying unbelievers, that just seems foreign to you, I would would encourage you, don't hear the word of God say, you need to grow and change and do better, because you can't. John Owen describes it as you're trying to patch a little hole in your wall while the whole house is burning down. You'll be focusing on the wrong thing. Don't focus on growing, focus on salvation. Focus on being converted. God has not called you to grow. He's called you to be saved. And today you've heard of the holiness of God and his right to judge, and you have heard of your sinfulness and your rejection of God. 
But you have also heard how God in his grace put forward Christ to be a propitiation for your sins, to take your payment, to take your punishment in your place. And that same Christ rose from the dead that you may have everlasting life with him if you would respond to the call of God and believe. Just like Nineveh, they heard God speak and they believed God and it was counted to them as righteousness. The same can be your truth today. If you are not in Christ, you cannot grow in holiness. But you can be saved and then grow in holiness. So if the word of God has convinced you of your need to change today, but you know you have not yet accepted the gospel, I pray, repent and believe. Jesus commands you to repent and believe. If that describes you today, come talk with me after the service. Talk with anyone here. We would love to help you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And for the believers, just as a, as a quick point, let's not be foolish Let's not try and change the world and expect unbelievers to act like believers. They're not going to do it because they don't have any reason to because in a kind way, they are ignorant. Let's not put our effort into telling them how we need to change the culture or what laws need to be passed or what protests we should be a part of. Let's spend our effort telling them about the gospel because that is the only hope for real change in this world. Let's focus on what is of first importance, Christ and him crucified. And with that, we come to the end of the book of Jonah. A few thoughts as we conclude it. You'll notice Jonah stops the book pretty abruptly. I think he does this on purpose. He doesn't record his answer to God's question. I think that's because he cares much more, not about his answer, but about your answer. He wants you to ponder God's question. Should he pity Nineveh? And if God should pity Nineveh, Shouldn't we pity Nineveh? And if we should pity Nineveh and unbelievers like them, what are we willing to do to see these image-bearing and immortal souls saved? Will we tell them the gospel of Jesus of which they are ignorant? Now, I know that God ends this book on a question, and we don't get closure to the story of Jonah. And God's word is sufficient. It is lacking nothing. But I want to tell you what many believe the end of the story of Jonah is, because I think it will challenge us and push us to greater obedience. Number one, I think the fact that we have the book of Jonah tells us that at some point he repented. Otherwise, why would he write this book about all his sin? I think Jonah repented and chose to become a faithful prophet. And he wrote this book to help lead Israel away from their prejudice and towards a Savior-centered life. But I want to push it a little step further. In the city of Mosul in Iraq, which is built on the outskirts of ancient Nineveh, there is a tomb there was a tomb. It was built in the 8th century, around the same time Jonah was in Nineveh. And it is built on the grounds of Nineveh's royal palace. And since that time, it has been known as the tomb of Jonah. I believe Jonah repented. I think he heard God's question, he was convicted of his sin, and he repented and he turned around and he went back into that city full of people he had hated. And he preached the salvation that belongs to Yahweh alone for the rest of his life and died there among those people he so recently hated. But that tomb is no longer standing. It was blown up by Islamic State terrorists in 2014. They were building a highway and wanted it out of the way. And I bring this up to ask us, what is the response of our hearts to hearing that? Were we angry that these people blew this up? Were we angry at these people who are ignorant of the gospel Jonah preached? Do we wish those immortal souls had been killed by a drone before they could have destroyed that place? Or do we mourn and pray for those made in God's image to hear the message of Jesus Christ to be saved? Do we value them more than something earthly like a tomb or much cattle? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true, that it tells us of a prophet who had no pity, but more importantly, it tells us of a prophet who was moved with pity, for he saw your people as sheep without a shepherd. God, we thank you for Jesus who came 
and preached the gospel of salvation and accomplish the gospel of salvation by taking our punishment in our place that we may be pardoned according to your sovereign will, that we may be saved. God, I pray if there's someone here today who is not a believer, draw them to repentance as you did Jonah. And God, for those of us here who are believers, break our hearts, fill us with pity for the lost around us, whether they're terrorists or people of other religions or our loved ones, or our neighbors. God, whoever they are, they're made in your image. Their souls are immortal, and they don't know you. And we were no different, and we are no different apart from your grace. God, fill us with pity. Let us be evangelists, not like Jonah, but like your son. God, work in our hearts that you may be glorified in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.